time. This morning, we have six speakers who will give about 30 minute statement. Please allow me to introduce them. First, Mr. Guo Ping, rotating chairman of Huawei. Mr. Guo joined the company in the Huawei's early age. He has taken leading roles, including R&D, supply chain, legal affairs, business process and IT management, corporate development, and devices. Dr. Song Liu Ping, Senior Vice President and Chief Legal Officer and Chief Compliance Officer of Huawei. Dr. Song is responsible for managing companies' legal functions, including developing and executing corporate level legal and intellectual property strategies. Mr. Glenn Nager, partner at Jones Day Law Firm. Mr. Nager has argued 13 cases before the US Supreme Court. He has served three branches of the United States government as chair of the board of directors of the office at the complaints of the US Congress Accountability Act. Mr. John Suffolk, senior vice president and global cybersecurity and privacy officer of Huawei. Mr. Suffolk oversees the design, enhancement, and implementation of Huawei's end-to-end -end global cybersecurity and privacy assurance system. Mr. Yang Chaobing, president of Huawei's 5G product line. Mr. Yang is responsible for strategic planning, delivery of Huawei's 5G solutions, bringing the next generation of wireless solutions to a fully connected society. Mr. Li Dafeng, executive member of the supervisory board, director of the ICT infrastructure managing board office. Mr. Li has more than 20 years experience in the telecom industry. He plays a key role in bridging the digital divide by providing quality and affordable solutions to customers. First, please welcome Mr. Guo Ping, Huawei's rotating chairman, to give his statement. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here. Today, Huawei announced it has filed a lawsuit against the US government to challenge the constitutionality of the Section 89 of the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act, or NDAA. Huawei seeks remedies, including a declaratory judgment that the restrictions targeting Huawei are unconstitutional, and a permanent injunction against these restrictions. The US Congress has repeatedly failed to produce any evidence to support its restrictions on Huawei products. After exhausting all other means to allay the doubts of some US lawmakers, we are left with no choice but to challenge the law in court. This ban not only to unlawful, but also harms both Huawei and US consumers. Huawei operates in more than 170 countries and regions. As a leading global technology provider, Huawei has always taken its responsibilities seriously. Specifically, the responsibility to make secure equipment that meets industry standards. For three decades, we have maintained a solid check record in cybersecurity. Huawei has not and will never implant black doors. We will never allow others to install any in our equipment. The US government has long branded Huawei a threat. It has hacked our servers and stolen our emails and source code. Despite this, the US government has never provided any evidence supporting the accusation that Huawei poses a cybersecurity threat. Still, the US government is sparing no effort to smear the company and mislead the public about Huawei. Even worse, the US government is trying to block us 
from the 5G market in other countries. Huawei has invested significantly to become the global leader of 5G. Given the United States has never presented any evidence to substantially substantiate its security allegation, we question its content of not wanting other countries to use Huawei. Is it a fate that other countries may catch up to and overtake its using uh, advanced 5G technologies? Maybe the US government incorrectly believes it would benefit from the suppression of Huawei. But the truth is, restricting Huawei's contribution to American and other nations' 5G networks will only harm their network interest, their national interests. Faster 5G network deployment can benefit all countries. Regrettably, the NDAA was enacted to restrict Huawei without giving us an opportunity to defend ourselves. Section AA9 of the 2019 NDAA prevents us from serving our US customers, damages our reputation, and deprives us of opportunities to serve customers outside the United States. It is the abuse of the US lawmaking process. This section strips Huawei of its due process, violate the separation of power principle, breaks US legal traditions, and goes against the very nature of the Constitution. Section 889 infringes upon our rights and harm U.S. consumers. In enacting the NDAA, Congress acted unconstitutionally as judge, jury, and executioner. Other countries are rightly resisting the U.S. government's campaign against Huawei. And even the U.S. president himself has recently questioned using artificial security reasons to block Huawei. If this law is set aside, as it should be, Huawei can bring more advanced technologies to the United States and help it build the best 5G networks. Huawei is willing to adjust the US government's security concern. Lifting the NDAA ban will give the US government the flexibility it needs to work with Huawei and solve real security issues. Huawei are compelled to take these legal actions as a proper and a last resort. We look forward to the court's verdict and the trust that it will be benefit both Huawei and the American people. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Song Liu Ping, the Chief Legal Officer of the Hua Company. This morning, Huawei Technology Co Limited and Huawei Technologies USA Incorporated filed a lawsuit in the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Texas, located in Plano, to defend ourselves and our customers from a U.S. statute that improperly targets 
and punish Huawei. That law, Section AA9 of the 2019 National Defense Authorization Act, singles out Huawei by name and not only bars U.S. government agencies from buying Huawei equipment and services, but also bars them from contracting with or awarding grants or loans to third parties who buy Huawei equipment or service, even if there is no impact or connection to the U.S. government. Our should tries to prevent the U.S. Congress from unconstitutionally impeding Huawei from bringing our advanced technologies to America, technologies that it is so desperately needs for building world-class 5G networks. Section A9 is unconstitutional in its singling out of Huawei by name, blacklisting it, damaging its reputation, and denying it any way to clear its name and escape sanction. Its attack on Huawei is purposeful and punitive. When the law was being passed, Senator Tom Cotton said that Huawei deserved the death penalty and that it should be put out of business in the United States. And Senator Mark Rubio smelled Huawei as a charging horse that shouldn't be in business in the United States in any capacity. Section AA9 causes injury to Huawei, but even more importantly, to Huawei's customers. It prevents Huawei from providing its world-leading technologies to any company that does business with the U U.S. government, regardless whether Huawei's products are used in service of the government. In doing so, the statute is punitive, pure, and simple. And in doing so, the statute denies um, Section AA9 causes injury to Huawei, but even more importantly, to Huawei's customers, it prevents Huawei from providing its work leading technologies to any company that does business with the US government, regardless whether Huawei's products are used in service of the government. In doing so, the statute is punitive, pure, and simple. And in doing so, the statute denies American con consumers access to the best technologies, particularly those in poor and rural community, where Huawei's competitors choose not to do business. Congress targeting of Huawei is also overbroad as well as ineffective. It is overbroad because the statute prohibits apply to every single agency of the federal government, even agencies that have no connection to foreign affairs, defense, or national security, like the Bureau of India Affairs or the U.S. Fishing and Wildlife Service. Even worse, the statute covers vast numbers of private companies that intend contract with federal agencies restricting Huawei's ability to work with such companies even on entirely private projects unrelated to their government contracts. 
Section AA9 is also ineffective in addressing cybersecurity risks. The supply chain is global. Numerous other companies manufacture products in or use components from China, and some major telecommunications companies operate joint venture with the Chinese government. But the NDA singles out a few like Huawei and ignores the bulk of the supply chain. Sadly, Section AA9 is based on numerous false, unproven, and untested position. Contrary to the status promise, Huawei is not owned, controlled, or influenced by the Chinese government. Moreover, Huawei has an excellent security record and program. No country evidence has been offered, and Huawei has never had a fair chance to confront or cross-examine its accusers, nor has it been allowed an impartial adjudicate. The U.S. Congress has simply acted as lawmaker, prosecutor, and juror at the same time. Contrary to the American Constitution, as a result, we have now sued the U.S. government and several of the many agency secretaries who are bound by Section AA9. These include the Secretary of Agriculture, the Acting Secretary of the Interior, and a few others. Section AA9 applies to these agencies even though they have absolutely nothing to do with national security or related errors. Or should ask us the court to de declare Section AA9 unconstitutional as it is applied to Huawei. We hope that the court will remove this unconstitutional infringement on federal agencies and Huawei so that we can work with the president and his administration to find a solution where Huawei's products are available to the American people and the national security of the United States is fully protected. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Glenn Nager. I'm a partner at Jones Day. Uh, Jones Day is honored to serve as lead counsel uh, for Huawei Technologies and Huawei Technologies USA in the filing of this lawsuit. The lawsuit raises three uh, distinct but related claims under the United States Constitution, under the Bill of Attainder Clause, under the Due Process Clause, and under the Vesting Clauses that protect the separation of powers of the United States Constitution. The Bill of Attainder Clause is a direct and express limitation on the power of the United States Congress. It prohibits legislation that selects out individuals and itself imposes punishment on them. And the complaint that we filed in this case argues that Section 889 of the NDAA violates this constitutional prescription because, uh, for among other reasons, it directly and permanently and irre irrevocably uh, bans Huawei from providing covered technology to the, not, not only the United States government, but also to contractors of the United States government and to recipients of federal loans and federal grants. The second claim in the case is based upon the Due Process Clause, and the Due Process Clause prohibits the deprivation of life, liberty, or, uh, or property without due process of law. Under this clause, a legislative enactment is constitutional only if it's done in accordance with generally applicable rules. And our complaint in this case argues that Section 889 is not such a generally applicable rule because it selects out Huawei and targets it, and it precludes it from selling its covered equipment uh, to the federal government, to federal contractors, and to loan and grant recipients. And indeed, Section 889 stigmatizes Huawei by insinuating that it's a tool of the Chinese government and is thus a security risk, which Huawei fundamentally denies. Finally, the Constitution's vesting clauses separate 
the legislative and executive and judicial powers of the United States and lodge those powers in distinct branches of the United States government. Under these vesting clauses, Congress only has the power to make rules, not to apply those rules to individuals. The application of rules is the province of the executive branch and of the courts. And our complaint in this case argues that Section 889 violates the vesting clauses and the separation of powers that's embodied in them because it is effectively adjudicating on its own whether or not Huawei is in fact influenced and subject to the Chinese government instead of allowing the executive and the courts uh, to make that judgment as the statute allows for all other companies. It's worthy noting that in signing the 2019 NDAA, the President of the United States objected that the NDAA violated separation of powers in a number of respects and constituted legislative overreach. And the lawsuit that we have filed today raises a similar objections that Section 889 violates the separation of powers and constitutes legislative overreach. We look forward to pursuing these claims in the federal courts. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm John Suffolk, and I am the Global Cybersecurity and Privacy uh, Officer for Huawei. Uh, let me start by saying we applaud any government or any organization that sets out the objectives of improving cybersecurity and concurrently improving the protection of personal data. And in the 170 countries in which we operate, we have worked tirelessly with our customers to help them achieve those objectives. But let me start by saying, just because you have a name on a box, doesn't mean that what's in that box always comes from that named ven vendor. Take Huawei, for example. Only about 30% of what's in a Huawei box actually comes from Huawei. The rest comes from a global supply chain. In March 2012, the USA Government Accounting Office did some work on supply chain security. And they took the humble laptop and found that there were components from at least 18 companies and as many countries making up a simple laptop. Other research over the years has reinforced the review that what's in technology now comes from a global supply chain. It's also true for European telecommunications companies. Uh, they have uh, uh, ven joint ventures with uh, Chinese-owned organizations. They buy parts from Chinese companies. It has a European label on, and that so-called European technology is sold freely around the world and in America. Most of the world's social media platforms and cloud platforms have technology built in Asia and built in, Ch in China. And indeed, in 2016, Apple had and, uh, 766 global suppliers, of which 346 were based in mainland China. And at that time, over half the iPhones were manufactured in China as well. Now, this global supply chain generates many thousands of weaknesses and vulnerabilities. As we all accept, there is no such thing as perfect technology. In 2017 and 2018 alone, there were 30,000 such published vulnerabilities from companies who do publish vulnerabilities. Nine out of the top ten organizations publishing vulnerabilities were American companies. 2017 also saw the splurge of malware, whether you want to look at WannaCry or Petya or Lockheed, or even hardware issues from companies such as Intel. None of that is coming from Huawei. Now, all governments and all companies can do more on their cyber security hygiene. There is more that we can do. And we are not short of knowing how to do cyber security hygiene to protect ourselves from almost all of the hackers other than the ardent, well-funded environments. There are many international standards. There's the ISO range, the NIST range. There's many best practice. But what we actually lack, though, is a concerted, collaborative, international effort to define global standards, global certifi certification schemes, global best practice that all vendors around the world can work to. Today, there is substantial evidence that people do not apply the best practice. 
one report sampled 1,200 US federal contractors across a whole host of industries and found that the vast majority fell well short of published US standards, even in industries such as aerospace and defense. And you can see the poor results of hygiene coming through on data breaches, whether you're looking at Yahoo or eBay or Equifax or the Office of Personal Management. Those data breaches, those weaknesses, are not coming from Huawei. We believe Huawei's approach to security by design, by development and deployment, sets a very high standard that a few can match. And at Huawei, we are very proud that we are the most open, most transparent organization in the world. And we allow our customers and their professional teams to come and audit and inspect and review everything that we do. And as one government put it to Huawei, we are probably the most strictest regime they have ever come across. We see that as a positive thing, not a negative thing. We are proud that we provide our most precious intellectual capacity for people to come and inspect. Now that's not to say that we are perfect. It's not to say that we always produce perfect code. It's not to say that we always execute every process first time correctly. No organization in the world can say that. But what we can say is this. We will continue to make multi-billion dollar investments into our R&D and our security. If we find issues in security, we will fix them. If we find ways to improve our processes, we will improve those processes. Our mission is quite simply this. We look to provide the safest, the most brilliant capability, the most environmentally friendly products and services that are safe and secure for our customers. Our focus on securing uh, our products will never cease. Our focus on protecting our customer data will never cease. We don't sell customer data, we don't monetize customer data, we protect it. We believe the solution to cybersecurity comes from openness, it comes from agreed international standards, it comes from transparency, and it comes from collaboration. And we hope America will join us in this journey. Thank you very much. <coughs> Distinguished guests, good morning. I'm Yang Chaobin, President of Huawei Huawei Geopolitical Line. Thank you all for being here today. Over three decades ago, President Ronald Reagan said that every new day begins with possibilities. Huawei technology is a great evidence of how true these words are today. <coughs> Compared with 4G, Huawei can deliver faster speed low latency, and more secure connections. This will mean much better network experience. The chief architect of BT recently said, Huawei is the only true 5G supplier right now. However, the 2019 NDAA still imposes undue restriction on Huawei, solely based on unfounded security concerns. We have an unblemished track record over 30 years in the 170 countries in which we operate. Excluding Huawei and blocking fair competition will lead to higher than necessarily network constraint cost for American carriers, lower the speed of the 5G deployment, and hurt the economy. Ultimately, prevent U.S. citizens from enjoying advance the 5G network and forcing them to bear extra communication expenses. According to the chief technical officer of TELUS, Huawei's presence in the market could drop prices by 15% at least. The GSMA estimates carrier capital expenditure in North America for 2017 to 2020 to reach around 136 billion US dollars. Even a 15% saving on that total flow, allowing Huawei to compete freely, would amount to 20 billion US dollars. In 2019, T-Mobile postponed the commercial 
use of its 5G network. AT&T announced that the speed of its so-called 5G network was less than 200 megabps, while clear LG Plus can provide download speeds exceeding 1.3 gigabps, facilitated by deployment of Huawei 5G technologies. After researching in 5G for over a decade, we are at least 12 to 18 months ahead of our industry peers. We have more than 2,570 essential patents, signed over 30 commercial contracts for 5G, and deployed 40,000 5G base stations, making us the number one 5G vendor in the world. Time and tide wait for no man. It took 10 years for 3G to reach 500 million users worldwide, five years for 4G, and we estimate it will be three years for 5G. Over 50 countries may allocate 5G spectrum resource this year, and Huawei has developed the most powerful, simple, and intelligent 5G network. I quote President Reagan at the beginning, but the full sentence is, every new day begins with possibilities. It's up to us to fill it with the things that move us forward, progress, and peace. Technology for the benefit of humanity is one such thing. It should not have any boundaries. Now, it's up to the American people to decide whether to move forward. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. I'm Li Dafeng, the, director, the executive director of the Supervisory Board and the director of the ICT Instructor Managing Board Office. I worked in Africa for nearly 10 years. In 2011, mobile payment was not started in China. But when I traveled to Kenya, I was so surprised to find that many Kenya people made payments and transfer while suffering comes in Pazza. Our mobile, uh, mobile uh, banking services, our mobile phone were not only for communication, but a part of life. Now, 90% of Kenya adults use in Pazza, which reduces the use of cash, crime also falls. From then on, I have been a strong believer that everyone in the world should be connected and entitled to enjoy the benefit of technology. Today, as many countries on the cusp of implementing 5G, what we need is open and fair competition. Instead, the U.S. government is using legislative overreach to impact, to interfere with the market. As it stands, it can't deploy the most advanced 5G technology on behalf of market player. Politicizing 5G will only cause damage to industry and businesses and it will inevitably inhibit U.S. consumers from reaping the potential economic and social benefit of 5G. Though we don't have many customers in the U.S., we have always driven to serve them with the best products and technologies. We believe even those living in rural, mountain, and far-flung areas deserve to be included in the digital world. Ever satisfied customer means than 20,000 or 30,000 residents in Kentucky and Tennessee can also enjoy high-speed internet as a result of our effort. Moreover, a market lacking in competition 
drives up the cost of network deployment. These costs are ultimately shouldered by consumers. As Ms. Jiang Xiaoping just stated, Huawei's participation could save the North American capital expenditure a minimum of 20 billion US dollars in four years. Currently, Huawei has over a thousand employees working across seven offices in the US. We also invested substantially in American telecommunication industry, including by establishing partnerships with hundreds of American companies. We purchased billions of dollars worth of components, equipments, and software from this company every year. The NDAA law can only impair Huawei's long-term commitment to invest more to hire more here. Though the world has made great progress in building an interconnected world, we should never forget that there are still more than 3.8 billion people who are offline, many of whom are Americans, and over 1 billion people without mobile broadband coverage. To be better connected is a relentless pursuit of humankind. No one should more obstacle in the way. Thank you. Thank you for all, thank you for all our speakers, and thanks to the audience for following us via the live feed.